thank you, everybody. Yeah, it's an amazing room. I promise you that at uh, 25 minutes, I will turn yellow, and then at 30 minutes, I will turn red. Um, since the topic of the symposium was expanding views on the emergence of the biosphere, I thought I would talk about plurality. Um, for the origin of life, we have many bodies of evidence, all complicated, that are relevant to understand. And it's possible to put together many possible scenarios for emergence that either emphasize different bodies of evidence or that interpret the same evidence in different ways. So then the question is, how do we want to get beyond the spinning of scenarios to a notion of cause? And how can we learn to think systematically about these problems? So a lot of times when people want to organize a diverse body of evidence, a starting point is definition. So I thought I would open with a good strong statement by Jack Shostak about how well that seems to be working in his opinion for the origin of life. Jack says, attempts to define life do not help to understand the origin of life. No, un no ambiguity there. So his argument is, you know, as with all things from Shostak, deeply empirical and very concerned with getting the details right. He says that there's a huge number of transitions that are qualitatively of different kinds that make up the emergence of a biosphere. And for people to artificially put a dichotomy in that and say that is not life, this is, that was before life, this is, is actually f not faithful to the nature of the evidence. And what we should do instead is just do careful science about the collection of diverse problems that we have to, s to deal with. As far as that goes, absolutely. And it's an important voice of discipline in what can sometimes be an undisciplined field. And yet, on the other hand, the notion since antiquity that there is a unity of living things in the world is still correct and it is still scientifically relevant. And the forest of life is more than the arbitrary sequence of trees that we happen to have chosen to study. Um, and that's, it's particularly important if we want to learn how to reason in the absence of evidence, which is important because what we don't know that's necessary is more important or is larger than what we do. So the question is, how do we understand both the multiplicity and the unity? That's sort of this notion of a pluribus unum, out of many things that remain many, when do they become an interdependent one while not losing their manyness? So um, here are two examples of trying to create definitions of life that come from different perspectives and emphasize different things. One is often uh, cited as the working definition of NASA, attributed to a working group that Jerry Joyce was uh, in or chair of, a self-maintaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Good features of this definition are it acknowledges the central role of chemistry, though without necessarily explaining why it should be central. The negative part is that it entails a lot of very complex concepts in that word Darwinian evolution. And in my opinion, others could disagree, it underemphasizes how hard it is to explain why those concept, concepts should be necessary to explain the structure of real matter. Uh, Pete Hood, one of the founding PIs of ELSI, takes a completely different approach on this. He wants to say that the origin of life is the emergence, the spontaneous of emergen emergence of autonomous agents in a complex system. The plus side of that is that it gives specific names to a lot of aspects of architecture that are fundamental to the biosphere and that precede evolution. So you need them to talk about where the Darwinian world enters. And some of them are importantly independently of it and yet still fundamental to the nature of life. The negative side is that it's about high level structure and it doesn't actually give a place to the conceptual role of chemistry. So you could argue that these are two complementary views of the ele elephant that cover different things. Now, when you put up a definition like this, you can ask, we try to find things according to attributes that other things don't share. But if we want a notion of cause, we need to get beyond just attributes to essences, things from which other things follow. And so we ask, in either of these definitions, are we just looking at attributes that are useful to distinguish life, or are we looking at essences that are good starting points in a theory of cause? So one way people try to get at what is a starting point in a complicated world is to make dichotomies, to take things that they think are alternatives and say, can we cut one of them out and say that the essence of life or of the origin of life is found in the other? So I'll give you three dichotomies, and I'll give you uh, what was in the abstract to this talk, the argument that both sides seem to be fundamental and the dichotomy is not a cut at all. So geochemical continuity or biochemical innovation. Uh, is life fundamentally a chemical system or fundamentally an informational system? And 
what should we think of as the unit of memory and persistence in the system? Organism, ecosystem, something else. So first question, is it an extension of geochemistry or an innovative departure? Uh, this is uh, from a paper by George Cooper looking at the volatile content of organics in carbonaceous meteorites. Cooper estimates that from the sample, there are at least 50,000, probably correcting for sample blind spots closer to a half a million, just volatile compounds in characteristic carbonaceous meteorite samples. Now, if you look at the GC spectra of these, you notice, first of all, that they are not uniform, they're not mud, and second, that they have a significant overlap with compounds that are very central to actual biochemistry. On the other hand, a half a million compounds is considerably larger and considerably less disciplined than biochemistry. Now Cooper, I apologize for the rendering of this slide, puts together a system in which he would say that pyruvate is the crucial non-equilibrium compound that can actually be driving all of this. So I should have mentioned at the beginning, the question of extending geochemistry or innovating away from it is sort of the main point that distinguishes people who want early metabolism to be a foundation versus people who want some sort of RNA-mediated central dogma type control to be the start. So this is meteoritic carbon, not so different from biochemistry. Contrast that with this. This is a paper by Vijay Srinivasan and Harold Morowitz from a few years ago, starting from the sequence genomes of aquificales, uh, reductive citric acid cycle autotrophs, and saying, can we distill from these complete genomes and then comparative analysis of alternatives in enzyme databases, a kind of minimal metabolism that is both universal across the biosphere and also sufficient to create any living system? And they say you can cut this down to about 125 monomers and small metabolites. And out of this, you build everything in the world. So we're down from a half a million to 125. So this says that the distinction in biochemistry that is conservative of geochemistry consists mostly of pruning, but that accounts for maybe a third of the compounds in this diagram, and the other two thirds are innovation. So, so far both. And of course, the attempt to make a dichotomy gets worse when you realize that the trajectory of geology, once a biosphere has emerged, can no longer be understood without the biosphere. So for instance, we have Bob Hazen's analysis, both in the empirical record, uh, and then by looking at mineral formation conditions, of the fact that the mineral inventory on Earth has changed cate categorically between the earliest record in the Archean into the Proterozoic. This is an index of the diversity of uh, boron minerals versus time, but Bob has similar tables for barium minerals and a variety of other things. And a lot of this is due to feedbacks from seeding the environment with oxygen. Some of it is due to microbial precipitation. So geology is no longer an abiotic concept once life exists. One can go even further. There's a fascinating argument. I don't know how strong it is. Uh, Minik Rosen and then two of our guests last year, Norm Sleep and Francie Albarede, are authors on this. They argue that something as remarkable as the innovation of photosynthesis by driving geochemical cycles through the biosphere actually changed the rate of granite formation and hence the accretion of continents and the formation of tectonic cycles. That, of course, affects the rate of cooling through the upper mantle, which then has implications for the maintenance of the geodynamo and the magnetic field and the conditions of the atmosphere. So the whole notion of making a dichotomy between the abiotic Earth and the biosphere looks like it's becoming a real mess. Okay, how about the second one? Is life fundamentally chemical or is it fundamentally informational? A lot of times when people say informational, they're asking about the combinatorics of sequences. There are a lot of places I could approach this, but let me do one in particular from the genetic code that allows me to illustrate the contrast. When we think about the combinatorial information in the genetic code that might reflect the action of selection, we think of taking the amino acids as given, that's somebody else's problem, and taking the number of times each one appears, just how many different shuffles could there be through the adapter apparatus of the genetic code that would still function? And you can do the combinatorics and you say, okay, there's about 230 bits of information that look like they were selected to produce this code out of anything with the same number of amino acids. But what if you said, let's not take the amino acid inventory as given, let's ask out of the carbonaceous inventory, how did that amino acid inventory get selected? Now you might argue that that's a separate problem of pruning that doesn't belong here, except that, and that's the content of this paper here, <coughs> 
the particular way the amino acid assignments are made in the genetic code is throughout based on the biosynthetic sequence of the amino acids, not just their terminal properties, but how they're made. So that argues that the identification of the amino acid inventory all the way from coming off of the citric acid cycle compounds to the first position on the codons and many other regularities through here was actually being done at the same time as at least the later stage of these assignments were being made. So I want to introduce the concept of embodied information, not merely combinatorial shuffling information, but the idea that inherent in the chemistry and the limitations in chemical pathways to get somewhere is much of the information that we think of as essential to the nature of the only life we know. And we can go beyond just the code. We can think of RNA and DNA. They are often thought of as the ultimate things selected to be carriers of any sequence. But if you think about the biochemical synthetic networks of, for instance, purine RNA, the embodied information in that is all information about crucial cofactors. Uh, whether you consider histidine a cofactor or not, we can talk about that. But these things are essential in catalysis. They're in essential in one carbon transport. And they're crucial cofactors in oxidation reduction chemistry, which are central to all of biochemistry. And so I don't think you understand the biotic position and maybe not the abiotic position of RNA and DNA until you have understood the embodied information in this chemical network that's preserved today in the cofactor world. Organism or ecosystem, our third dichotomy. Steve Gould in The Structure of Evolutionary Theory makes the argument that Darwin was very focused on the organism as the unit of memory, even though he was a consummate ecologist. And from 1859 with the origin through the modern synthesis in the 30s with its emphasis on what we can say about the statistics of genomes to then the Williams Dawkins emphasis in the 60s on the gene as the building block of memory, we have become progressively, I would say, narrower and harder in what we allow to be an evolutionary entity. But I think this is an intellectual mistake because it increasingly takes the entities for granted and not explains why they exist. And it's ruling out the role of informational or relational variables as carriers of information. Now, I won't talk about it today. It's not like everyone has forgotten relations. There is good pushback within science on what the relational variables carry. But the important point is that in our formal theory of evolutionary memory, population genetics, the non-entities become beanbags or communities, the genome or the ecosystem. And so they leave out the role of the relational variables. What I want to show you in the next couple slides is that that narrow evolutionary view of entities does not actually say anything about the particularity of the biochemistry I just showed you. Meaning that had the biochemistry been different, we would tell exactly the same story about genes, genomes, and Darwinism, which means that by being correct for everything, they explain nothing. So the embodied information I would say we have in these population level things takes the form of typologies. How is it possible and how is it not possible to form a cell or an organism? Evolutionary change happens within the typology of the possible. Now for organisms, the two most basic, I would argue, typological questions are, is it autotrophic or heterotrophic? So is it metabolically self-sufficient or can you not understand its metabolism, except in the context of the ecosystem it depends on? And is it an anaerobic or an aerobic metabolism fundamentally? So are its energy sources more reduced or more oxidized than the net biological carbon? Now the interesting thing is that the anaerobic aerobic variable is also a type variable for ecosystems. The auto-hetero distinction requires the emergence of organisms to even become a meaningful thing to say, whereas the aerobe-anaerobe distinction does not. And I'm going to argue that that's more fundamental, and in particular that it is more closely connected to what I will say is the most universal feature in the biosphere, and that's the following. Everything that you synthesize to make a living organism has its original starting point in one of four or five compounds that happen to be intermediates in the citric acid cycle. There can be a lot of twists and turns, building up and breaking down and sharing in ecosystems, but this is true across everything that is preserved that we know of in the biosphere and as far as we know throughout the history of life. Now, in order for that to be true, that it's a biosynthetic universal, 
This is a picture of where it lies within a small network of 37 compounds, which is the core of the core. We can cut down the Srinivasan Morowitz set of 125 small meta metabolites that are necessary and sufficient to this core, which actually organizes them all. In order for these to be the universal starting points in biosynthesis, they must also have been the reference points for all subsequent evolutionary innovation. So these are all of the other autocatal autocatalytic loop feedback pathways drawn as a kind of a metro map with different pathways in different colors. And the thing that you can see, and it's a different talk to give you all the details on this, is that they either reuse or re-enter or simply duplicate with some context change the arcs that are there in this core metabolism. And all of this comes from the anaerobic world that is the core in both ecosystems or organisms. So it's not a cellular property. So the argument that I'll make is that the ecosystem is more fundamentally the explanatory unit for this universal biochemistry than the organism is. The reason being that the anchor status of the citric acid cycle or its reductive version, intermediate metabolites, that can always be seen at the level of self-sufficient ecosystems because they have to make everything. We don't depend on carbon from space anymore if there was a time when we once did. It happens that in the case for, of autotrophic organisms, you can see it at the level of the single organism, but that's a question of how biochemistry comes under genomic control, which is a higher order organizational question. It's not about the nature of what biochemistry must be. So in evolutionary dynamics, the embodied information about the precursors is carried not by individual descent lineages, but by coevolutionary dynamics where the ecosystem members affect each other. Now some of it can just reflect the environment, passing through, but the rest of it is frequency dependent fitness where completeness or compatibility is propagated through things like ecological stoichiometry to make sure that the members of the ecosystem do everything that needs to get done. So coming back to Shostak's objection, this looks very strong. Looking for life, non-life categories in terms of these dichotomies doesn't seem to be working for us. Okay, so why is that and what can we do as an alternative approach? I would argue that the problem with this domain approach to starting is that every domain is carrying some features that are essential to life, but for none of these do the features that that domain has seem to, pre seem to account for all of the others that are also fundamental. So instead of starting with domains, can we make a kind of directed graph of the way information or constraint propagates from one domain to another, and at the kind of beginning of that directed graph, can we look for a starting point? This is where the physicists have something to do that's not completely empty, because this is a problem that's thoroughly understood for the hierarchy of matter. This is the entire 20th century in physics, and it's probably the best thing that's understood within the physical sciences. It introduces a set of concepts that are readily applicable to life, but that are not commonly used in biology, and it's all about embodied information. So let me give you some of this argument in a level of detail that I don't usually pursue. In the simple physics of phase transitions, the idea of embodiment means the structure of the state space. This determines what information is available to be found when a phase transition happens. Seth Lloyd in his book, Computing the Universe, likes to talk about hierarchies of phase transitions as creating information. I'd rather say that the information is already there in the structure of the state space, but when systems are amorphous, they don't express it. And when they freeze and become ordered, that becomes expressed. So, the example is, for instance, a collection of spins that make up a magnet. Each of them might be up or down. The state space is some hypercube whose dimension is how many spins there are. There are lots of configurations where the number of up and down spins are about the same. And if the magnet is hot, you live in this domain of large numbers and you can't see that the up and the down are squeezed into little corners of the state space. But as you freeze, your actual system state go gets stuck in one of these little corners and then the properties of the magnet start to display the properties of the squeezed corners of the state space. And that formerly hidden information becomes available. So I'm gonna add a couple of other concepts to this and then argue that we can do this for life as well. Second concept that's brought into existence by phase transitions is what we'll call long range order. And this is where we're gonna get directionality from. The idea is the following. When something freezes, you have a bunch of local degrees of freedom or building blocks that might have some group of configurations they can occupy. And when they're melted, the groups are all independent, so we write it as a product. 
But any product could also be written as a collective effect where they all do the same thing, which is then this H1. And then the first difference where they deviate from doing the same thing, that's H2. And we can go and we can fill out the same state space the same way. When something freezes, one of these collective things gets frozen and they get stuck in a corner of the state space and they can't sample everything anymore. And it's only the remaining degrees of freedom that wind up free to vary. This story of phase transitions turns out to be the entire modern theory of the hierarchy of matter. And if you look at these iconic graphs going from the Big Bang to the modern world, every one of these transitions is one of these freezings. The interesting reason there's directionality in this is that the more local the degrees of freedom are, the ones that are easier to find the order in, they make smaller building blocks and they're more rigid. Those rigid building blocks that assemble first act as constraints on what can be assembled later. And because a constraint is a restriction on the available state space, that propagates upward in the hierarchy of form as a kind of information. And this is where I'm going to argue embodied information comes from. So here's an example where that argument was, has been invoked explicitly in biology. Remember the genetic code. What kind of information could be selected for in the genetic code? You would think the genetic code could, should be a firewall because there's all this inescapable structure in metabolism and you don't want that propagating through to your sequence world. You want any sequence to be available so that proteins can be selected based on the phenotype. The reason you can't, the code should not be completely agnostic about structure is that translation doesn't always work perfectly and some of this structure leaks through. So if the codons are arranged in such a way that they can mask the errors as much as possible, you can get a flatter state space here than the structured state space of the chemistry that's leaking through in selecting what your molecules are. So Nigel Goldenfeld and Colleen Vetsigian and Carl Woese, following up on some of Carl's ideas about the Darwinian threshold, a few years ago asked, is it realistic to think that codon rearrangements can actually get a genetic code that is as good at buffering as the code we actually see? And their argument was, after the Darwinian threshold, when organisms have barriers against horizontal gene transfer and the components of the ribosome in different organisms are not permitted to be exchanged because that's too damaging to the fidelity of translation, in such a world there is long range order and you can't actually rearrange the codons well enough to get the degree of buffering we see. It is only in a world of extensive horizontal gene transfer where you make the fitness of a gene local. You evaluate it in the context of all other genes where it could occupy an organism. And then you make your, your proteins statistical so that they are robust against all the errors in that ugly world and therefore they're tolerant of exchange of coding positions. Only in that kind of a world can you actually optimize to the point where you get a code that is as good as the code we see. So the, mess, the substance of their message is that this thermalization, which then locks in the optimal genetic code when the ribosome becomes accurate and the Darwinian world of persistent lineages emerges, only that thermalization was a kind of Wittgenstein's ladder on which the biosphere could have climbed up with the solution that it currently has. So the reason we can make use of some of this quantitatively is that the story I just told you has mathematical structure. The important way to understand the origin of directionality is to recognize that robustness in phase transitions comes in classes. The master formula for everything, in fact, I don't know if you realize there was a master formula for everything. This is called the formula for large deviation scaling and it is the reason a macro world exists. It says that when you have probability distributions for systems with a lot of components, the only times you get a macro world is when the probability turns out to split into a term where the scale can vary in a way that doesn't have to be precise, but the structure of the macro world remains well defined across a whole variety of scales. This is what you don't have in the micro world where it matters whether you have one, two, or three molecules, but you do have in the world of a cat where it doesn't matter whether the cat has inhaled or exhaled more or fewer molecules of O2 or CO2. And the place where phase transitions occur is when these structure factors, factors change between one major domain and another. The interesting thing is that the characteristics of structure 
are different in different classes of phase transitions. So there are some for which there's only solution, oh, only one solution, like an ideal gas, this vial of chlorine. You will always go to the same state. There are others, like the simple second order phase transitions, like frost, where the crystal magnitude will look the same, but the direction is uncertain. And these guys can drift over time, but it's a closed-ended drift. And I mean this in the sense of closed-ended evolution. And then the furthest we've gotten in physics is to look at glasses, where you now have a set of possible solutions that are indefinitely large as the system becomes big, and they can drift in an open-ended way in finite systems. So does the biosphere have such closed and open-ended? I would argue yes. It, the biosphere contains chance and necessity, and they are all equally fundamental aspects of life. The small molecule world looks more like the necessary geochemical world than it looks like the world of the accidents of species, and then many aspects of cellular architecture live somewhere along the, the spectrum between. I'm very nearly out of time. There's stuff I won't be able to show you, but I'll show you a couple more things. Fascinating thing is that in the biosphere, there is an inverse hierarchy. You know, they say diamonds are forever. Diamonds are not forever on the surface of the earth, but they will last longer than the person you give them to, and that's enough. But in the world, in the world of equilibrium physics, the unit cell of the diamond is persistent because the diamond is hard and durable. In the biosphere, it's exactly the opposite. The most durable patterns, the, the metabolic chart that I showed you, are carried by the small metabolites that turn over on time scales from milliseconds to tens of seconds. Individual organisms last longer. They can be 20 minutes to perhaps 100 years. Species may have a tenure going up to a million years as a characteristic figure of merit. Ecosystems can switch on a time scale from a month to the durations of keystone species in them. The interesting thing is that the more durable the pattern we're talking about or the entities of that pattern, the more arbitrary and the less stable in geological time that pattern is. So I want to argue in the previous story about local things being robust things, that it is precisely this smallness in space and short turnover in time that identifies the starting point for cause in the biosphere. Now, the reason this subject has teeth is that everything we can do in equilibrium phase transitions can be mapped to dynamics. And the fascinating thing is that when you do map it to dynamics, you are in the world of dynamical error correction. So this is the mapping. Um, we can come back and I can talk offline about all these particular things. They're laid out here. But the important point is there are new concepts that are introduced in optimal error correction that enable us, I think, to get better clarity on what we see in the biological world around us. Um, I can't do this, so I'm going to skip to something because this is a point that can be made simply. In any error correcting system where you have only finitely many degrees of freedom that are used to look for errors through redundancy and to correct them, anything finite will always with certainty eventually decode to the wrong answer. The only thing that never decodes to the wrong answer is something like the ideal gas that only has one answer, so the code is not doing anything. In the biological world, the only thing that there's exactly one of is the universal core metabolism. All the rest of these guys are error messages that are carried with finite probability of error. So I will stop in honor of time. You have another minute to wrap up. Like. And leave you with the summary comments. There's other stuff that I'm happy to cover. The main things that I want, to take, I want to give you to take from this are that when we take the mathematically founded concepts of phases that are understood well in equilibrium into the dynamical world that we need to understand biology, they do not look like the physics of equilibrium, except mathematically. They become the theory of optimal error correction about which we have our own base of knowledge. Important thing comprehensive, asymptotically reliable error correction, meaning the biosphere has been with the planet the entire time, even though all of its subunits of organization turn over. That's the elephant in the room, not only of all biology, but of all reductionist science. We don't have a theory of where that comes from. The fact that it has a substructure allows us to interpret biological phenomena in terms of directionality. An important three-way trade-off between redundancy, complexity, and reliability 
is what gives us the hierarchy where local things are rigid and the prior sources of constraint. And the asymptotic unreliability of anything finite, if it has any non-zero complexity, is what gives us the need for uncodes that are the reference for everything else to come back to. And I want to argue that universal core metabolism is the uncode, and it's the classical state variable for the biosphere that defines the nature of life. So all of the rest of the complexity is still there, and it's as hard as it ever was. This is only meant to be a way to try to systematically look at how we choose projects in it. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So now we have uh, time for questions. I saw Mark's hand go up first. Do we have, uh, so we have some, uh, Mark, Mark right here. Uh, one question about the directionality. Um, do you think that the directionality is affected by hysteresis in, this, in any way? So is there a memory of how life is the process of going from one phase transition to the next, if you will, affecting the evolution? So if, you, if it changes somehow, is there a memory of that changing? Right. Um, for some things, almost surely. For other things, I think it's less likely. So Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book called Cat's Cradle about somebody who discovers a new form of ice that in all the oceans and all the history of the world was never discovered even though it happens at room temperature and it brings an end to the world because it propagates and freezes everything. That kind of thing I think we can say never happens because the problem of finding an orientation of ice requires only getting a couple molecules into the right orientation. So nothing like that has an opportunity for hysteresis. Those are the sorts of things where unique solutions get found incredibly robustly and usually very fast. It is not clear yet whether core metabolism has that status. And on a slide I didn't show you about where the forefront of current work is. The reason it's not clear is that we don't know enough about the chemical state space and the chemical process space. That question is answerable with work within the reasonable time frame of decades, if we can just get organized and do it. If you look at other things as far out as the distinction between simple amino acids and more complex amino acids, or some of the later stages in biosynthesis of the cofactors, I think there you may have a strong argument that ex post selection can lock in features that are partly arbitrary and that have very long downstream consequences. So for instance, look at arginine as an amino acid. It has a very, very specific role as positively charged coordination groups in all protein structure. But the biosynthesis of that does not look like something that's absolutely inevitable given core metabolism. It looks like the sort of thing that can be locked in at a later stage. So I think we see a progression from less to more hysteresis. And to quantify that is one of the important areas of work. Yeah, yes, Eric. Um, you use the word universal core metabolism. And I, and I assume you mean global core metabolism? Or do you really mean universal in the sense that we should look for it on Mars and other Earth-like planets elsewhere in the universe? But the question then becomes, if we're going to look for this core metabolism, what is the biggest observational signature of it that we would look for on a place like Mars or eventually other planets, the atmospheres of chemical disequilibrium on other planets? Yeah, great. Um, when I say universal, I mean empirically universal with respect to the way all the life forms we know use it. I, do, I cannot yet make the claim that it is predicted from first principles of physics and a knowledge of the planetary boundary conditions for exactly the point we just discussed. We don't know enough about the state space. The question about how you map that into exoplanet signatures is actually really hard because the difference between a non-living Earth and alert, an Earth with only anaerobic life, unless Rosing and Sleep and Alberede are right, and this has an effect on continent formation that you can separate from a null model that you can control. I don't even know what you look for in planetary surface conditions. The sledgehammer on Earth was the emergence of oxygenic photosynthesis and the burial of the resulting organic carbon. And even that, the exoplanet people are still willing to argue about whether they could reliably distinguish. And that's between you know, the Archean and the Proterozoic. That's not part of the universal core. But and that, I don't think we can argue is part of the universal core from the things I can see. But that's not a strongly held opinion. I was going to ask a similar question. Um, basically, 
that universal core would be the equivalent of a thermodynamic minimum. Is yes. that correct? Exactly. It would be a state variable that there's only one solution for. Right. So is there any way to actually do a delta on that and test to see whether or not it falls back into that minimum? I don't know how you do that experimentally on the time scales we have, but I do think that you can use comparative evolutionary analysis to make arguments that are not completely empty. So evolution is full of dogs that didn't bark in the sense that once you have the sophistication of genomes and proteins, you would think you could innovate an awful lot of stuff. And yet innovation in things like carbon fixation pathways has been extremely limited and it has apparently existed within a restricted frame in time. So, of course, the things that are not strong enough to be constraints in the sense that there's no possible variation can still show up as strong forces to evolutionary convergence or the inability for things to gain a fitness advantage from, by deviating from. So, it's not as good as a controlled experiment, but we can try to argue that the absence of innovations where you would think genomically we had the technology to do it points to paths of least resistance in the small molecule chemistry that there was no advantage to departing from. It's not great. Yeah. So the universal core is a product of information processing as well. It has enzymes and, and th those are a product of the information. So where would that leave the, the universal core uh, core being un a product of uncode yeah. or uncoded. I don't think I would say it's a product of them. I would say that the only place we see it today is where it's supported by them. It may be because it's a product of them, but it could be that we have a new thing in science that we have to understand, which is how can there be only one solution to something, but the only context in which we see that one solution is when it's supported by feedback from things that have many solutions. Charlie has one. Yeah, Eric, in, in the beginning of your talk, you, you mentioned you had a nice diagram where you talked about auto and hetero, and then you compared that to anaerobe versus aerobe. And you said that one of those dichotomies was more fundamental than the other one. Yeah. For an argument, I, did, I couldn't follow that. Could you okay. explain that a little bit sure. more carefully? In order for something to be an autotroph or a heterotroph, it has to actually exist as an organism that's distinct from the ecosystem that it inhabits or that is coextensive with the ecosystem, right? So an autotroph is biochemically self-sufficient, which means that you can put it in a mineral medium and it will survive. A heterotroph is not biochemically self-sufficient, which means without the detailed dependence on its ecosystem, it doesn't persist. But that's actually a question of the relation between biochemistry and the way genome control is partitioned among autonomous units. Right, and that's, that's distinct that's from the question of whether or not your electron flow is downhill in the reducing direction or downhill in the oxidizing direction. Yes, but you said one of those dichotomies was more universal. Than I, can't, I can't express auto-hetero dichotomy for an ecosystem because all ecosystems are self-sufficient. There is no distinction available. So anaerobe and aerobe is the more fundamental thing that came first and then came the hetero auto. Yeah, it's more than I gave you reason to believe in this talk, but I would argue that that is a prior constraint at the ecosystem level and that then organism organization distills out of that once you solve a lot of other problems of how you want to partition the control of that biochemistry under the mechanism of Darwinian selection acting on genomes. So another way to say that is that ecosystems are auto. No. <laughs> that, that's a very popular way to say it, but I think that is one of these popular things in science that makes it harder to think clearly. <laughs> Autotrophy and heterotrophy are ecological concepts. And so to talk about an e ecosystem as being autotrophic is to take the term out of the place where it makes a helpful distinction and put it into a place where it makes it easier to get confused. Just to continue on this question, how do you define an ecosystem then? 
an ecosystem, okay, good. There are two ways you can look at it. The way that is less than complete is to define an ecosystem as an assembled community of member species that have some necessary relations to each other, biochemical or behavioral or niche constructing or whatever. I think that's inadequate because it denies the ecosystem the status of being an elementary entity in its own right. And I think that's what gave us the unfortunate departure into the Gaia hypothesis because they were left with no way to refer to the ecosystem as an elementary entity. They had to try to call it a super organism, but it's not organized and it doesn't change the way an organism does. Ecosystems may be more or less self-sufficient. So to do this carefully, what you want to say is, with respect to a certain criterion of biochemical self-sufficiency, I can draw a boundary here and place everything within it and say that's an ecosystem that carries itself at that level. So for some purposes, a lake is, or a coral reef is. For other purposes, a lake or a coral reef are not self-sufficient enough and you have to go to a much wider system. So it's complicated to say clearly, and it depends on what question you want to ask. Okay, so thank you, Eric. <laughs>